All right, so for for development of our head and neck, we we basically talk about pharyngeal arcs, pharyngeal pouches, and um, pharyngeal clefts. But that alone, it's an overstatement because we need to build up um, a story to how we end up with this pharyngeal arcs. Right. So in a developing baby, we, we have what we call mesenchyme. Mesenchyme is simply the connective tissue for the baby. And most of the time, this mesenchyme, <coughs> excuse me, this mesenchyme is going to originate from mesoderm most of the time. But for the purposes of the head and neck, we have various sources for this mesenchyme. Right. So the mesenchyme in the head and neck comes from four sources. Number, number one and number two, they are both mesodermal layers because from our general embryology, we, we divide mesoderm into paraxial mesoderm, the one that forms <coughs> somites and somitomeres. And if you remember well, uh, those take part in the formation of some of the bones of the head and neck, particularly the neurocranium. Then, um, so that's paraxial mesoderm. Then we have intermediate mesoderm, which forms genitourinary structures. So it has nothing to do with the head and neck. Then the last um, uh, mesoderm is lateral plate mesoderm, which mostly, <coughs> in terms of the skeleton, it forms um, the bones of the limbs, that is your upper limb and the lower limb, and also forms the heart. But for the purpose of head and neck, it forms the larynx, basically the laryngeal cartilages. So when we get to larynx in terms of development, we will now say L for L. Lateral plate mesoderm will give rise to the larynx. So we have lateral plate mesoderm, we have paraxial mesoderm. They take part in the formation of mesenchyme in the head and neck. Then the third layer of um, of your gem layers that gives rise to that gives rise to yeah, yeah. that gives rise to your mesenchyme in the head and neck are neural crystals. Neural crystals are derived from neural crystals are derived from the ectoderm layer. Remember, ectoderm has a neural plate at the center. Then you have surface ectoderm on either side. But the junction between neural plate and surface ectoderm gives rise to a set of cells that we call neural crest cells. And the neural crest cells. Hello? Um, is that a question? Yeah, can you repeat what you just said? Which part? Of the neural crystals, how they are formed. Okay, so isn't we have ectoderm? Uh -huh. Do you guys do molecular regulation or you just do embryology without the, without the molecular biology? Molecular what? So you have answered me. Okay, fine. You've answered well. You've answered me. So... We have what we have what, we have molecules that direct development. Um, in this case, we have bone morphogenic protein uh, four and some transforming growth factors. So expression of those in ectoderm in different quantities specifies our ectoderm to say where we have high BMP, we form this. Where we have low BMP, we form this. Where we have intermediate levels of BMP, we form this. And that's how we can divide our ectoderm into three. A central neural plate, which um, undergoes neuralation to form a neural tube when you do development of the central nervous system. Then on the outside, we have surface ectoderm, the one that is responsible for the formation of our epidermis in the skin. But I was saying that between the neural plate and the surface ectoderm, <coughs> There's a region of intermediate bone morphogenic protein levels, which specifies to form neural crest cells. 
and neural crest cells they they basically form um more structures than any other gem layer be it ectoderm mesoderm or endoderm that is why on their own they can be referred to as the fourth gem layer right we used to have a question that 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 read neural crest cells are a fourth gem layer discuss so you now give um explanations as to how Neural crystals basically take part in the formation of everything from the head and neck, the heart. They will form part of the, <coughs> the ganglia and the GI tract, wherever. They form part of the teeth. They form, they, they basically form a lot of things. Right? So part of the mesenchyme in the head and neck comes from neural crystals. Then the fourth thing, it's ectoderm. Ectoderm will form what are known as ectodermal placards. If I'm able to get to the eye and the ear in this session, you'll be able to see how there are thickenings of ectoderm that appear on either side of the brain uh, and they form on, on either side of the developing brain rather, and they form the eye and the ear. Then uh, another one that is less talked about um, will form the nose. <coughs> we call them ectodermal placards. Right. Right. So for a developing baby, for the head and neck structures, the most distinctive feature that we see are these pharyngeal arcs. So I, I really didn't want to leave this page because that's the picture that I want to use. But if you look at this, um, this developing embryo, these are what we are calling pharyngeal arcs. <coughs> right. And <coughs> They used to be called branchial gills because they resemble <laughs> the gills in fish. Right? I'm sure you guys have seen fish, right? Mm. Yes. So they resemble the gills in, in fish. <laughs> That's why back then they used to be called um, branchial. Uh, branchial actually referring to to, to gills and fish, branchial gills. Right. So these pharyngeal arcs, they appear between, where is that page now? They appear between, um, uh, I'm not losing my picture, wait, what happened now? Sorry. So these pharyngeal arcs, they appear between <coughs> the fourth and the fifth week. Right. So <coughs> I have the first arc, second arc, third arc, fourth arc, then from fourth, I jump to sixth. There is no fifth arc. So depending on the text that you guys will use, not so sure which book you use, um, some say the fifth pharyngeal arc forms, then it regresses. Some say it never forms. So in this pharyngeal arcs, that's where I find mesenchyme. And mesenchyme, remember I said it comes from four sources. Then on the outside, I have what I call pharyngeal clefts. Those clefts will be lined by ectoderm. Remember, ectoderm is the gem layer on the outside. On the inside, I have what I call pouches. Remember, <coughs> the gem layer on the, on the inner aspect is endoderm. So these pharyngeal pouches are going to be lined by endoderm. So I have a cleft on the outside, which has ectoderm. I have a pouch on the inside, which has endoderm. So in layman terms, it's as if I see cleft, then I see arc, then I see pouch. That's in layman. But in reality, Look where the, power, the arc is. Can you see the arc here? Let's say arc number one, this one. Can you see where my cursor is? Yeah, we can. Then, yes, we can. then down here, this is my first cleft in blue here. Yeah? This is my first pouch. So the cleft and the arc, they're almost aligned, but there is something that separates <laughs> <clears throat> that separates them. 
the brown in between the cleft and the archaea. We call them pharyngeal membranes. I'm mentioning this because they form something as well. So between the cleft and the pouch, I have pharyngeal membranes. And I also need to know what my pharyngeal membranes give rise to. Right. Okay. So now that we have done the gross, embryology becomes easier. The other way would also work. Starting with the embryology, then you do the gross. So structures that come from the first arc <coughs> are innervated by the trigeminal nerve. So anything that you have come across in your gross anatomy, which is innervated by the trigeminal nerve, specifically muscles innervated by V3, which is the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve, they come from the first arc. Remember V3 will only innervate muscles of mastication plus tensor palati, tensor tympani, mylohyoid, as well as the anterior bell of the digastric. So any muscle that you have come across in gross that is innervated by the tri any branch of the trigeminal and only V3 from trigeminal, it has a motor component. So only those muscles will come from the first arc. So the easiest way to get this is each arc forms its muscles, forms its skeleton, has its own artery, has its own nerve, then it has clinicals. If you can do that for every arc, you answer every question for each arc. So muscles derived from the first arc, I've already mentioned the innervation of the first arc. It's the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. So muscles derived from the first arc, I have muscles of mastication, which is temporalis, masseter, lateral pterygoid, medial pterygoid. Then the nerve to the medial pterygoid, if you go to gross, it also innervates two tensors, <coughs> tensor tympani and tensor palati, meaning to say those two muscles, they also come from the first arc. <laughs> then there's another nerve called nerve to mylohyoid, which is a branch of inferior alveolar nerve, which comes from V3. That nerve innervates the mylohyoid muscle, the muscle, <coughs> the muscle that separates the oral cavity from the submandibular region. And that muscle also comes from the first arc. And um, that, that nerve, that muscle also innervates the anterior belly of the digastric. So that muscle is also coming from the first arc. That's the bone. Yes. Where? The Sarak Mashuri. Little Kumbo. The Gumra Pama Pharyngeal Cliffs. Okay, I'm not talking about pharyngeal arcs. <clears throat> and I'm saying each pharyngeal arc has its own nerve supply. So the easiest way to remember what comes from a pharyngeal arc is to look at the gross anatomy now. <clears throat> For example, first arc structures are innervated by the trigeminal nerve, right? Or oh, trigeminal nerve, remember it is uh, V1, V2, V3. And if you look at them from a gross anatomy perspective, only V3 is a, is a motor component. So muscles from the first arc, they have to be muscles innervated by V3 which are muscles of mastication. Temporalis, masseter, <coughs> um, lateral pterygoid, and medial pterygoid. Then it also innervates um, tensor tympani, tensor palati, and it also innervates um, 
the Milo Hyatt Maso and the Antinia Bell of the Dega Street. Don't worry much if you if your network gets a bit um a bit bogus. I, I'll try send the recording on the group before I sleep. Okay, then the bony component from the first arc. Um, before I mention that, what's the difference between the word ventral and the word dorsal? Guys, what's ventral, what's dorsal? What do the two words mean? If you can, if you can understand the words, it makes your life really easy. I think ventral and dorsal is still the same. Isn't it the same with anterior and posterior? No. And no. <laughs> I wouldn't be asking if it was that simple. So yes, in gross anatomy, they try to make them the same, but in embryology, that's where the difference really is. So remember a baby, when the baby is developing, they're crouched like this. Can you see my posture? Yeah. Right. So what's below is ventral. What on top is dorsal. So as humans, yes, we are then going to stand. We are different from the other animals. And when we stand, the ventral surface, which for animals is below, if we stand, that ventral surface comes anterior. So we'll then think ventral and anterior are the same things, but no. Then dorsal becomes posterior, but yeah. In, in, in embryology, there are different terms. <clears throat> so the skeletal component of the first arc divides into a ventral process and a dorsal process. Ventral means below. So one process is called mandibular, the other one is called maxillary. So if you can put your face down like this, the mandible is below, the maxilla is on top. Meaning the, mandible, the mandibular process is ventral, then the maxillary process is dorsal. That's why I asked. <laughs> Mandibular process will give rise to the mandible. Maxillary process will give rise not only to the maxilla, but also it gives what I call the, the zygomatic bone. Um, it also gives the, the squamous part of the temporal bone. Right. If I'm to ask, what types of ossification are there for bones? There are two. There are two. Okay. Yes, I'm listening. Uh, the endocranial membranous. You mean intramembranous? Mm. What's the difference between the two? What's the difference between endochondral and uh, intramembranous? If you can know that difference, we can relate to this. Intermembranous, it forms flat bones. And endochondral, it forms long. The rest, I think. Intermembranous forms uh, flat and irregular. And endochondral forms the rest. If I was an, if I was an examiner, I, 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 I wouldn't try with you. Then, based on what you say, then I'll tell you the clavicle is a long bone, but it comes from intramembranous ossification. <laughs> Your definition will not will not work anymore. Okay, got you. Okay, let me put it like this: uh, endochondral. Uh, what is intramembranous? 
it forms bones of the skull, including the and uh, plus the clavicle. No, let's not go there. <laughs> Intramembranous, what's endochondral? You are now trying to tell me what each process gives. What are these processes? All right, do you want the definition? Do you want the process? Yeah. How are you forming the bone? Okay, uh, it's not endochondron. And the we start with the uh, hyaline cartilage. Then from hyaline cartilage, we form. Uh, uh, what happens? It it becomes vascular. The 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 the, the endochondron the the pero perichondrium, right? It becomes vascular. Uh, the cells that differentiate. Yeah. Anyway, the simplest yeah. definition is in endochondral ossification, <clears throat> I lay down a model of the bone that I want to make using hyaline cartilage. If I want to make a bone that looks like a, a drumstick, <clears throat> I just need hyaline cartilage to model and become a drumstick so that when I then have osteoprogenitor cells coming to form osteoblasts and the osteocytes laying down bone. I'm laying the bone around a pre-existing model that is already in the shape of what I want to make. So I will be laying down the bone and the cartilage will be dying. Meaning those blood vessels that you mentioned earlier that are supporting that hyaline cartilage, they should regress. Because if they regress, the cartilage lacks the blood supply now and it start, it will start to involute and I'll start to make bone around the dying cartilage. Intramembranous is just a way of forming bones within membranes. And for the purpose of this pharyngeal ox, I said the ox are mesenchyme. Mesenchyme is a form of membrane. So all those... <coughs> All those bones that I'm going to say are coming from the pharyngeal arc. They are forming within the mesenchyme, which is the membrane in cords. So they are going to come from intramembranous ossification. And if you draw yourself back to embryology of bones, bones of the face are all derived from intramembranous ossification. Because they're coming from this pharyngeal ox. Where there's mesenchyme, which are actually a core of mesenchyme. Right. <clears throat> so I've, I've said the first arc divides into a ventral process, the mandibular process, which gives rise to the mandible. Then um, there's a dorsal process, the maxillary process which gives rise to the maxilla, something called the pre-maxilla, then also forms the zygomatic bone and um, the, the squamous part of, um, of uh, the, the temporal bone, right? Okay, then each arc, also has its cartilaginous component. The cartilage of the first arc is known as Merkel's cartilage. Friends and family, Merkel's cartilage should degenerate, but it does not degenerate completely, meaning it's going to form so a few things, and the few things that it forms are three in number. Remember the middle ear, there are three ossicles, the malleus, the incus, and the steps. Another way to look at these things is to say things that start with an S are more likely going to come from the second arc. If you look at second arc structures, most of them start with an S. So between malleus, incus, and steps, I already need to remove the steps. 
it's from the second arc. So the Malias and the Incas, they are derived from that Mekos cartilage. <coughs> around, um, okay, let me not say the month, but around fourth month, they would have ossified intrauterine, that is, but I, I don't think that's important to know. So Malias and Incas, they come from Mekos cartilage. Then the third thing that comes from Mekos cartilage is a ligament that you find on your temporal mandibular joint. The ligament is known as sphenomandibular ligament. The ligament that joins the lingula on the mandible, on the inner aspect of the mandible, the lingula to the, the sphenoid bone. So that's one of the exceptions where we see an S coming from an arc, not the first arc. We'll see there the exception on the third arc. Right. So sphenomandibular ligament plus the malleus and the incas they come from the cartilage of the first arc, known as Merkel's cartilage. So we do arcs on their own. Don't read first arc, then go first pouch, then go first cleft. You, you confuse yourself. So do all the arcs, do all the pouches, do all the clefts. So once you've done the first arc, <coughs> on the second arc, I'm just looking at <clears throat> the same order that I did for the first arc. What's the inner version of the second arc? The second arc is also known as the hyoid arc. Hyoid for hyoid bone in the neck. H-Y-O-I-D. Though it does not form the entire hyoid bone. So the second arc, the inner version is the facial nerve. <clears throat> so under muscles, I need to remember muscles from gross that are innervated by the facial nerve. And those are muscles of facial expression. Those around the orbit, those around the nose, and those around the oral cavity. Plus platysma, of course, in the superficial fascia of the neck. So those are muscles of facial expression. <coughs> they come from the second arc. What other muscles do you remember from gross that are innervated by the facial nerve? Hello. Any other muscle that you remember? Not even one. <coughs> For first arc, I remember saying anterior belly of digastric. What about the posterior belly? What innervated? I, I, I also remember saying that when I did the triangles. <laughs> so posterior belly of digastric is innervated by facial nerve. It's also part of the second arc. Posterior bell of the digastric plus another muscle known as the stylohyoid muscle, which is almost div difficult to separate <coughs> from that posterior bell of the digastric because they move together. The stylohyoid plus posterior bell of the digastric. In terms of the skeletal component, the second arc forms. Did you guys look at the hyoid bone? Do you know the structure of the hyoid bone? Hello? Anyone knows the structure of the hyoid bone? If it's a no, it's a no. You just say no and I, I try to explain it. No. So hyoid bone is um, something like this. 
So it is a body. <coughs> then extending from the body are what we call <coughs> greater corners. So these are greater corners. Then at the junction of the body and the greater corner, there is appearance of what we call lesser corner. At the junction of the body and the greater corner. <coughs> so the second arc will form the upper part of the body of the hyoid bone plus the lesser corner. So lesser cornu plus the upper part of the body. When we go to third arc, third arc will now form greater cornu <coughs> and the lower part of the body. But for second arc, second arc is giving us, second arc is giving us lesser lesser corner and upper part of the body. Then the greater corner and the lower part of the body, that will be the skeletal component of um, the third arc. Right. Then other structures that come from the second arc in terms of skeletal, I'm thinking of <coughs> things that start with an S. So I have a styloid process of the temporal bone. Remember, I have the steps. Is a small ossicle in the middle ear. On muscles, I had left out stapedius. I don't know why. Stapedius, second arc. Tenta tympani, we said, first arc. So there is a systematic way to remember this, the way I'm saying it. If, if, if you then just jump into a book, it becomes so hard. Third arc, nerve of third arc is glossopharyngeal. There's only one muscle in the body innervated by the glossopharyngeal, meaning that's the only muscle that comes from the third arc. It's a muscle on the pharynx that we call the stylopharyngeus. Then in terms of skeletal, third arc, we said it forms the greater cornu <coughs> plus uh, the lower part of um, the lower part of the, the body of the hyoid bone. Other books call them horns. So you can either say greater horn, lesser horn, it's up to you. Right? I don't know what book you guys use, but. It, it, it just differs. I think this book that I'm using here uses horns, if I'm not mistaken. So far, so good. Uh, third, third pharyngeal arc gives me greater horn and uh, lower part of the body of the hyoid bone. Okay. Then we say the second arc which we also call the hyoid arc, would give me the lesser horn plus the upper part of the, of the body. Okay. So can you rejoin saying um, less than a minute left now, I think. So rejoin using the same link. <clears throat> 